Well, good morning and welcome again. It's fall. Everything is pumpkin spiced. Everything. Fall is a great time of the year. It's a time when our schedules transition. It's a, it's a time when the leaves begin to change color. It's a time when our wardrobe changes. So no more wearing white, just in case you were all wondering. And most importantly, it's when our small groups get a reboot. If you are not yet in one of our small groups, well, you may feel like something's missing in your life. And if you feel like something's missing in your life, it's because something is missing in your life. <clears throat> so I want to just invite you in. You know, in light of everything that's going on today, and in light of my, my, my own ex personal experiences of my past, I don't know how people battle the darkness of everyday life without having a community group to, to grow in and to pray for and to have them praying for you and, and to, to encourage you and to dig deep into the word. If you're not connected into a group, well, now is the time for you to do so. Give it a try for just a few weeks. Don't commit to your whole life, just a few weeks. See if you begin to feel that void that begins to shrink in your life. Well, today we're beginning a new message series and it's called I'm In. So I have a question for you this morning. Are you in? Say, I'm in. I'm in. Ah, there's less hesitation in this group than the earlier group. Some of you may be thinking, what is Pastor Tom got us into? What am I going to be volunteering for? Well, I want to introduce you to the, uh, the themes that we're going to have over the next few weeks. So you can see where we're going. And then when we get there, you can look back and see how you got there. The last couple of weeks, we've been examining the desired identities of the church in Christ. We called it our house. And we said that a God-honoring church is one in where the community follows God's great commission to, to go out into the world and to spread the word of the gospel. We said that it's a community that practices awesome community by, by loving others well. We said it follows the great commandment by loving God first and then loving our neighbor. And then finally, it's a community that brings together all of its spiritual gifts. It collaborates to produce fruitful blessings upon the world. Now that series, that series that we're going to transition from, from the identity of the church in Christ. And now we're going to look at our own identity in Christ. And we're going to examine God's word. And in doing that, we will discover four qualities that are true of us, true identities of who you are in Christ. And to make it all a little bit easier for you to remember these, they, they all begin with the letters I-N, in. So today we're going to begin with invited. Say that, I'm invited. I'm invited. And then the next characteristic and quality we're going to look at is invaluable. Say, I'm invaluable. I'm invaluable. You all have a gift. And every gift is important to God. Everyone matters in the family of God. You are invaluable. And the next identity is influential. Say, I'm influential. I'm influential. The good news that we know from reading scripture is that every one of us has influence. If you're a follower of Christ, you were created by God to, to influence others, to be, to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. You were designed to influence others for God's glory and for God's praise. And then lastly, we're going to look at invested. Say, I'm invested. We are invested in the work of God. So who you are in Christ is invited, invaluable, influential, and invested. Now, this morning, we're going to look at one very core theme of our scriptures, and that is that you are invited into God's family. What a better day that we have than this morning at the earlier service, we invited a new member into the family of God. And this morning, McGill spoke for us as one of our new members who's been invited into the family of God. Now, I don't know about you. Perhaps it's, perhaps it's just me. But one of the worst feelings I have is the feeling of being left out. It's, it's the feeling of being uninvited. I don't know if you ever looked on your social media and you, you saw a picture of some event or party that was happening and you weren't there and you thought, 
Why wasn't I invited? Or perhaps you went to breakfast or lunch with some friends and somebody started talking about an event and you thought to yourself, why wasn't I invited? Growing up, I experienced this on a daily basis in school. Now, this morning, I want you to really put your imagination caps on, but in elementary and high school, I was not an athlete. Not even close. I was very overweight, and I had the, the agility and, and the dexterity of a three-toed sloth. <laughs> I dreaded gym class. I never climbed that rope. Do you remember that rope? Did everybody know about the rope in gym class? I never climbed that rope. I couldn't even hang from that rope. So every class, I was the last one picked. Basketball, soccer, dodgeball, field day, and even archery. Last one picked. Bullying is not something new to millennials. It's something that's been going on for generations. Now, when I was in school, athletes are very popular and they were invited to everything. Those like me who wore heavy sweaters and large shirts to cover our shame, we were the butt of all jokes. We were cast out, not only of the social circles, but of life in general. Even, even adults would look down with pity. To, to be to not be invited and to feel uninvited was a common daily emotion. Today, I hear that there are specific groups that are being bullied. And I think more accurately, we bully anyone around us who's different, anyone who doesn't meet our standards. White versus black, male versus female, parents versus Teachers, employers versus employees, churched versus unchurched. If you've ever felt ashamed or unworthy or unwanted or uninvited, I want you to hear one of the greatest truths we find in the Gospels about Jesus. Jesus invites the people others reject. Jesus invites the people others reject. He invites those that religion rejects. He invites those who are overlooked. He invites those who feel like they are not good enough. In Luke's gospel in chapter 7, we hear Jesus doing this very thing. But this morning, I want you to hear a little bit of the backstory. How did we get to this part of the reading for this morning? You see, when, when Jesus was here walking on the earth, ministering to people, he, he claimed to be God in the flesh. And people were a bit confused. They were a bit skeptical. They didn't know if he was, if he was serious or if he was possessed by a demon. And they asked themselves, if he is the son of God, why isn't he hanging out with the Pharisees? Why isn't he hanging out with those religious people that we all know? They're the ones with the robes and the tassels. They're the ones with the elaborate cleansing ceremonies. They're the ones who could preach eloquent prayers and, and preached on the street corners. They knew so much more than just the common average person. And they were never in the company of sinners because that would make them unclean. So we get to this part of the story in, in, in Luke's gospel, and, and we meet a Pharisee by the name of Simon. And we find that Simon's hosting a garden party. Now, this is a garden party. It's not a tailgate. It's not a backyard barbecue. It's a very formal event. And the event brings other Pharisees together so they can gather around the table and have deep religious and theological conversations and discussions. They would all puff themselves up, you know, saying what they knew and showing off all of their knowledge to their friends. Now, this meal would take place in the outer room of the house. And it's where other people who are walking by, passerbys, could, could see and could hear them and what they were doing. 
Now the gate to the outer room would also be left open. And so people could come in and again watch and, and just be amazed at how intelligent they were as they were having discussions. So what happens at that party and that Luke tells us in this gospel is Jesus is invited to this party. And while he's there, an uninvited guest shows up. In verse 37, it says, A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. Now, the translation from Luke's day into the, to the modern language that we would use means a sinful life means she's a prostitute. So imagine a room filled with pious, religious, you know, men who were just puffing themselves up with their knowledge, going on and on and on. And in walks a woman whom they say is filled with sin. I would imagine some of them shouted out in fear. I would imagine some of them probably even ran from the room. She wasn't invited. She's unclean. She's impure. She's unworthy to even be there. And in our vernacular today, the names she was being called, well, those names might be a little different, but it's all for the same reason. Now, I want you to think a moment about this woman. Get a picture in your mind. This woman is a, is a young girl in her life. Maybe she's 10 or 11 years old and she's gathered with some friends and, and they're having a tea party. And they're all going around dreaming about the future and about their lives. And, and some of those girls would say they want to be mothers. Some would say they want to be doctors. Some would say they want to travel the world. And this woman would, would have a big smile on her face and she would say, I want to grow up being ashamed of my life all the time selling my body. She never said that. She never dreamt that for her life. And if that is not what she was dreaming for her life, then how did she end up here? In this place. At this party. Because that lifestyle is certainly not going to make her famous or admired or even respected. It was not going to be a situation where there was a proud family waiting for her at home when she came home from work. She wasn't going to have lots of friends who were going to be seen with her in public. You know, I don't know, maybe she had an abusive dad. Or she had abusive parents. Or perhaps her parents died at a very young age and left her with younger sisters and brothers to care for. Maybe she got tempted by the wrong crowd. Or maybe she got forced into the wrong crowd by a bad boyfriend. However, she wasn't able to become secure in her identity in Christ. And she ended up looking for love in all the wrong places. Now, we don't know the specifics, but we do know and can be certain that she did not want that lifestyle. And everywhere she did look, if she wanted out of it, everywhere she looked, female friends, they wouldn't associate with her. The Pharisees, well, they told her she was unclean and she couldn't even come to church. The community would walk on the other side of the street to not be near her. Parents would tell their children as she walked by, there goes the example of walking sin. She never felt invited not to go anywhere or to be with anyone. You might feel like that today in your life. You might be thinking that you're not good enough. You might be feeling guilty that about where you've been or, or what you've done. You might be feeling poor about the temptations that you've given into or the things that you've said or even the thoughts that you've had. You might be thinking right now in your stage of life, I never thought I would be blank. I never thought I would be here. I never thought I would be addicted. I never thought I would be divorced or bankrupt. I never thought I'd be unemployed. I never thought I would be gay or lesbian or straight. 
I never thought I wouldn't be wanted by my children. Whatever it is that you're thinking about yourself that makes you feel that uninvited feeling, this woman felt that way as well. And so what does she do? She walked into that garden party. She went straight up to Jesus. And she worshiped him in the most, the most extravagant way that she possibly could. In verse 38, it says, she stood behind him at his feet weeping and she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair. She kissed them and she poured perfume on them. The most extravagant way to worship in just two small verses of our scripture. We need to understand the depth of this worship. We need to understand just how extravagant this act truly is. You see, she comes into that garden party facing possible persecution for where she is because she's not invited. She breaks down and cries in front of all of these strangers and she has uncontrollable tears and then she gives away her most valuable possession, the perfume. It was most likely worth a whole year's worth of wages and it represents her lifestyle and she gives it all to Jesus. You see, normal women didn't wear perfume. Most of them couldn't even afford that perfume. That perfume was a symbol of her future. It's what attracted her clients to her. It's what told the whole world who she thought she was, an object for sale. So in that one simple act of going in to that garden party, she worships and she repents. She hands over to Jesus the possession that represents her future. She gives her most valuable possession, her entire future, and she lays it at the feet of Jesus. Then as she's kneeling over, she, she unbundles her hair and she wipes his feet with her hair. Kneeling, she's crying uncontrollably and the tears are running down her face and she wipes his feet. In Jesus' day, unbundling her hair like that would have been a, a great act of disrespect. It would have been very unfitting, would have been very unbecoming. Jewish women never let their hair down in public. Only their husbands ever saw that. And so all this has happened, this extravagant worship has happened, and now we get to see the Pharisee's reaction. When the Pharisee who had invited him, name is Simon, saw this, Simon said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who he is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Now notice the Pharisee Simon he didn't say these words out loud. This was a thought he had in his head. This was something he said to himself. And what he was saying is, well, obviously Jesus is not the son of God. Because look what he's doing. He's touching someone and, and being with someone who is unworthy. Someone who was uninvited. Someone who was unclean. Someone who was unloved. And then this is where the miracle happens. Jesus responds to the thought. Jesus can read your thoughts. And Jesus answers Simon and he says, Simon, I have something to tell you. And, and this is when Jesus explains something very important. He explains something to Simon and to all of us, something called great love. 
In verse 47, he says, Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has been shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. So here's your question for this morning. Why did this woman risk so much to be at the feet of Jesus? I mean, why did she risk shame, possible persecution, even going in there? The ridicule and the embarrassment of of going through the crowd and and trying to get away through the gate and through the yard and, and all the way up to the table where Jesus was sitting? Why did she risk all the whispering that was happening behind her? All the back talk and the gossip that was happening. Maybe even the anger. Maybe people were angry at her and yelling at her. Why did she risk all of that? The shunning that would happen. Why risk all of that? Well, Luke's gospel doesn't go into great detail about that. But I think if we look at what happened that day, If we look at what happened that day, we might be able to shed some light on an answer for that question. You see, we know Jesus had been traveling town to town. He had been preaching and teaching. He had been healing and and forgiving. And we know that every time he did that, crowds gathered. They came from everywhere and they gathered to hear his his teaching and his stories. And those who were there listening to these stories, they then went out and told others these same stories. Earlier in this very same chapter of Luke, he makes reference to when the disciples of John the Baptist had come to Jesus to ask questions. If we look over in Matthew's gospel, Matthew goes into great detail about how Jesus answered those questions how he was teaching the disciples of John the Baptist. It says as as John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd. And he says this, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest For your souls. He told that entire crowd that was gathered, You are invited. You are welcome. You can come just as you are. You don't have to get dressed up. There's no need to be perfect. There's no need to get it all straight. You don't have to sing all the notes perfectly. Come. Come. You are are invited. And so I wonder, do you think that woman was there earlier in the day? Do you think maybe she was standing in the back, way in the back because she couldn't come out of public? Maybe she was even around the corner where she couldn't be seen, but she could certainly hear what was happening. And maybe she overheard this lesson from Jesus. Come you are invited. From this story in Luke of the woman anointing the feet of Jesus, I want you to notice something very important. At no time does pointing out this woman's sin lead her out of the lifestyle of sin. At no point in time does shunning her or casting her out of the community, bullying her or gossiping about her None of that freed her from a shameful past. What did change her and what did free her was an invitation. Come. Come as you are. Come and come to know the Son of God. Come and experience His grace. Come and get to know His goodness and His mercy. Come to feel His love and receive His freedom in your life. Come. And and you all know this. Why did Jesus come? Jesus came not for the healthy, not for the pious and the religious. Jesus came for the sick to be healed. And Jesus said it. You 
are invited. Say that. I'm invited. It doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. If you ever felt unwanted, you are wanted here. If you ever felt like a failure, then you are a success in the arms of Jesus. If you felt hurt by the church, then I want you to know that you are loved and invited by God. Jesus says, come. Come with your addictions, come with your hangups, come with your baggage, come with your past, come with your doubts and your questions. Come. Come and he will give you rest. So now that we know the story of this woman who anointed Jesus' feet, now what? What do we do now? How do we move forward? How do we, how do we then answer the call that we've heard in this story? Well, here's the very first thing you have to do today. Take the next step. Just take the next step. If you're here this morning and you haven't surrendered your heart and your life to Jesus, then today is the day to do that. If you're out there watching online, wherever you are, it's time to come to the gathering. It's time to come. It's come, time to come and be with others who are filled with faults and doubts. Others who are filled with worry and shame. It's time to come because Jesus says you are invited. And if you've experienced this invitation by Jesus in your life, if you've experienced and accepted that invitation, if you've known the feeling of receiving his grace and his glory, then today is the time for you to be a living invitation. Time for you to take the next step and be the invitation for others. Invite others to come to know Jesus. Tell people about what Jesus has done in your life and what you've seen in the world. It's time for you to share what you know and what you've experienced. It's time for you to deliver those who feel uninvited, unworthy, ashamed. It's time for you to invite those and deliver them to the arms of Jesus, to the feet of Jesus. Today, I urge you, I urge you to accept the invitation because you're invited. Say, I'm invited. And as a person in Christ, as a creation of our great father, God, you are invited. You are invaluable. You're influential. And he's invested in you. And he's just waiting, just waiting for you to be invested in him. Amen.